Good morning, good morning. Good to see you here, all of you. Give me a little wave, would you, just so I know you're out there. Yes, indeed. Uh, no, you don't have to do that, but I understand a little bit about it. I'm learning. Hey, our friend Nathan Cook has a quick announcement for us, so listen up. Nathan? We do a, a 50s camp, 50s plus camp, uh, at Latham Springs every January, April, and September. Uh, the April one is tomorrow, and the Baylor Singing Seniors will be our special choir there. It starts at, uh, registration is 8.30 to 9.30, uh, and they have kolaches, they have all kinds of fruit, and they have all kinds of uh, goodies there for you. Uh, it's an $8 cost, and that covers everything, including lunch. We start, like, 9.30 is when the... Uh, the program begins 8.30 to 9.30 is the registration. Uh, we're through by about 2.30. Uh, so uh, it's a great time. About 55, I think, of the sen singing seniors are going to be there. And they'll do two 30-minute programs, one in the morning. Levi Price, by the way, a member of our church, will be doing a Bible study right after I sing a solo. <laughs> All right. It'll be a good setup, and thank you for that, Nathan. I did print a few copies of Worthy is the Lamb, uh, the duet last week from Neil and Lisa, and some of you really appreciated that. And uh, There's a copy back there if you'd like to have it. Also, a copy, if you missed last week, the four gospel writers um, in sequence have given us the outline of all the things that happened during Holy Week. It does require a magnifying glass, or at least it did for me, but um, it's a pretty good article to, to benefit from. Um, as you think about Holy Week. Now, um, in your packet today, there are a number of verses to start the packet about rejoice and rejoicing. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to find at least one or two, not more than two necessarily, that really speak to you this morning in about 30 seconds or less. Just scan those scriptures and see if something really resonates with your heart and your life and your being today. Take a few moments. Lots of scriptures there from which to choose. Old Testament, New Testament. Things you really recognize. Maybe some things that are a little bit new to you. Okay, now for our special moment. I'm sure you found, you found one or two that really vibrate with your spirit today i want to invite you all if you can get up then get up and go if you can't get up stay where you are somebody's going to come to you i want you to find some people at least two people and share what scriptures you really found important to you today about rejoicing because this is the season when we rejoice the most so here we go everybody stand everybody stand go find some people and share with one another what your rejoice scriptures are. Don't, don't do it to your spouse or your best friend that you're sitting with. Go find somebody else, Geneva. Go find somebody else, Paula. Not your best friends. Come on, find somebody you don't know quite as well. Here you go, Maggie. Find somebody to share with. Go see Susan. That's good, Maggie. Go see Susan right there. What are those scriptures about rejoicing that really speak to you? Something a little different. Hey, how do you say this word? Thank you. It's cool, man. 
Thank you very much. Looks like you shared some scriptures and I see a lot of smiles. Hope you had a, just a moment or two of rejoicing. This is our season where we live our life rejoicing. I was so moved on Thursday night at Monday Thursday service when Matt reminded us that Jesus and the disciples sang together. The scripture says they sang a hymn and went out. We are a singing people because our Christ sang, taught us how to sing. So I want to invite you to turn to the responsive reading that's there in your packet. We'll move forward now. Keep those rejoicing scriptures handy and look, look to those from time to time. They'll put a smile on your face and, and a song in your heart along the way. We want to look back just a bit today to this wonderful event that transpired uh, it's not that we skip over it, but it's, it's, it has its really its own place. And thank you, Andy, for playing while we were sharing our rejoicing scripture. That's the very first arrangement Andy wrote of a hymn setting. It's in a setting of amazing grace. One day, play it for us when we're quiet and can really can take it all in. Thank you for that. So in our, in our scripture today, I'd like to invite the men, if you would read the light print, and women, if you would read the dark print. Susie James is going to assist us with this. This is a scripture, Mary and Jesus in the garden. Everybody find that page. Men, if you'll begin with me. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. May God bless the reading of this scripture and just resonate within us. C. Austin Miles was 44 years old when he wrote In the Garden. And there has, for many decades, been an association between what we just read, that scripture, John 20, 11 through 18, and the hymn in the garden, which is based on that. Uh, Austin Miles was asked, uh, he was already a notable composer, but he was asked to write a hymn that would be, quote, sympathetic in tone, bringing tenderness in every line, one that would bring hope to the hopeless, rest for the weary, and downy pillows to dying beds. Interesting last phrase there. Asked to do that by a music publisher. And so one day in April of 1912, let me read his words. I was seated in the dark room where I kept my photographic equipment and organ. I drew my Bible toward me. It opened at my favorite chapter, John 20. Whether by chance or inspiration, let each reader decide. That meeting of Jesus and Mary had lost none of its power and charm. As I read it that day, I seemed to be part of the scene. 
I became a silent witness to that dramatic moment in Mary's life when she knelt before her Lord and cried, Teacher, Rabboni. And there's more to that story. I'd encourage you if you'd like to kind of get the rest of it, look, look that up. It's available to us. So um, he wrote these three stanzas as quickly as possible on that very day. And later that evening, wrote the music to go with it. So perhaps that gives you a little bit of meaning and significance and an understanding. One of the reasons why we sing that hymn is because it's based on the scripture that we just read. Let's sing it together today in the garden. a hymn medley of familiar hymns now that really do unite us. You're singing so well today. Don't hold anything back. Today in our sense of joy on this Resurrection Wednesday, Jesus is alive. We are delighted to be his people and joyful about it. My Jesus, I love thee. When you get to the fourth and final stanza, everybody sing the melody on that. Thank you very much.
Oh, it brings back a lot of vacation Bible school memories, William. It's hard for me not to start doing hand motions. I resisted. I want to share a scripture with you from Hebrews chapter 10. I'll begin reading in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another up toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Would you pray with me? Lord, on this Easter Wednesday, this this Resurrection Wednesday, we give you thanks once again for the cross, for the empty tomb, for that journey from the grave to the skies where you are seated at the right hand of the Father. God, it's by your presence there before the throne uh, that we can come boldly and approach, God, approach to say, thank you. God, thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us through the cross. God, once again, we confess our need of your forgiveness. As we confessed last week at Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, we, we confess here on this Resurrection Wednesday, we still stand in need of your grace and mercy, and we thank you for it. God, we thank you for your empowering presence in our lives. God, we thank you that you have not left us alone, but have given us your Holy Spirit. God, by that Spirit, we ask that we would stir one another up toward love and toward good deeds. God, we ask that your Spirit would stir us and that we would then stir others. God, that is our prayer for this hour of worship. That's our prayer for every hour of every day. God, would you move among us? God, would you transform us by your renewing grace? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. together. Thank you. 
I had to make sure it was my turn. I saw one more song in there. I got a little, got a little, got a little tripped up. <laughs> I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Zechariah chapter four. We've made our way to the to the fourth chapter of Zechariah. Today's vision is the vision of the lampstand and two olive trees. The lampstand and two olive trees. Let's read and then we'll pray together. Then the angel who had been talking with me returned and woke me as though I'd been asleep. What do you see now, he asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, each having seven spouts with wicks, and I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, what are these, my Lord, what do they mean? Do you, don't you know, the angel asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it, may God bless it. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. Then I ask the angel, what are these two olive trees on each side of the lampstand? And what are the two olive branches that pour out golden oil through two gold tubes? Don't you know, we ask? No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, they represent the two anointed ones who stand in the court of the Lord of all the earth. Let's pray together. Our good and our holy God, we thank you for a moment in the middle of a week to come into a, a still and quiet room and gather our hearts together in worship. We thank you, Lord, for the strength that comes from mutual encouragement, from the strength that comes from being together in your name. Lord, we thank you for the refreshing that we receive from your spirit as we sing and as you inhabit the praise of your people. Lord, we thank you for a chance to pray to you in this place for each other, for your work to be done in this earth, for our neighbors and the nations. Lord, we thank you for a chance to gather around your word and to consider it together, to be drawn in, becoming more like your son, our Savior, Jesus. We pray that you'd be with us now as we study a portion of your scripture Give us something that will shape us, form us, correct us, and encourage us today. Or we pray this in Christ's holy name, and we say together, amen and amen. Flannery O'Connor is one of my favorite writers. M many of you know that about me. I, 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 I read her all the time. Uh, she's a rough writer, though. I mean, she's not for early morning with your breakfast. I mean, she, she's a tough old bird, you know. And uh, one time they asked her about her figures and her characters and the images. And she said, to the heart of hearing, you shout. And to those who can barely see, you draw startling figures. And she says, we're living in a time where people are hard of hearing and can hardly see the truths of things. So to them, I shout and I drive, draw startling figures. I thought that was a great answer to why she wrote the way she did. Uh, one of the reasons I like the prophetic material, things like Zechariah, is because it shouts at you, because they're, they're startling figures. And often as you read through these texts, somebody's being awakened, somebody's being woken up. Now, I have teenagers in my home still, and so some of you might remember the days when you had to wake up a teenager. Uh, you know, Dad, please help me make sure I'm up at 7, i got to be at such and such and such and such. Now, they always resent you when you do it, uh, but they're always grateful that you did. 
Uh, but from time to time, and it's getting much better, but around that 13, 14 year old range, it was a real trick, right? Uh, to wake people up. And so I think you have a lot of the same thing going on in the prophetic material. God is speaking to a people who are in a deep slumber, who, who are down. Uh, and sometimes you get into a deep slumber because you don't want to get out of bed because you're depressed. Sometimes it's during a season of growth, like a little baby or a teenager, where they just really want to sleep an awful lot and need to. And sometimes those kind of seasons come together in our hearts, where things are growing in the dark. And Israel is in one of those seasons where they were down. I mean, they, they, were, they were in a deep slumber because they were collectively depressed. But God was growing something in that darkness. Uh, it was also a season of growth. And so he sent prophets to them when their work bogged down to remind them of who they were, who they are, what he was about, and what the work was going to be. And that's what we've experienced in Zechariah over and over and over again. We, we've heard the, the trumpet shouting, and we've seen the startling figures, and we see people getting awoken, awake, awoken. That's not even a word. We see him waking up. And we have that in this chapter as well. And it is a startling figure that we get. Uh, and one that's not easily accessible to us because we go to the corners of our houses and do this and the lights turn on. Most of you have a lamp somewhere you could find, uh, but it's purely uh, something that's decorative. Um, you don't depend on it day to day to day. But if you did... If you And maybe you have our season of your life dependent on lamps that were not electric. There may be one or two of you that have those kind of miles on you, or you lived in those kind of circumstances. Uh, but if you depended on lamps, you would know how valuable the oil is, right? To run out of the oil is to run out of the light. And if you could tell somebody back in the days of Zechariah, I'm going to provide for you a lamp that is self-loading, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sell you a car that also comes with a gas station. I'm going to give you a, an EV, but you don't have to plug it in. It just never quits. How many of you would buy a Tesla if you didn't have to plug it in, even if it did cost what they cost? If you never had to recharge the bad boy, you'd go get it and drive it till you died. So Zechariah gets this vision. The angel of God, the messenger, wakes him up, gives him a vision. And it's of a lampstand that comes with an olive tree that perpetually feeds the lampstand and it never runs out of light. A car with a gas station. There's the image. And so here's the image that he gets. Uh, and he says, what am I looking at? What is this? And it was very plain what he was looking at. He was looking at a lampstand that never ran out of oil because it came with two olive trees. And just to emphasize that, the angel said back to Zechariah, don't you know what you're looking at? Like, man, I know this sounds too good to be true, but this is what I'm showing you. He said, but what, what does this mean? What does this mean? So you have the vision in the first four verses, and then you have the meaning of it in 5 to 10. Note again the attitude of Zechariah when he's confronted with the word from the Lord. He comes with this spirit of humble in, of inquisition. What does this mean? That's repeated three times in our chapter today. What does this mean? Uh, and here is the meaning, 5 to 10. He says, this is the word of God to Zerubbabel, who is the governor. Verse 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's one of the great underlined verses in all of the Bible, isn't it? Sometimes it's frequently quoted without any notion where it came from. It came from here. It came from here. Here is an encouragement to God's people that this work that has stalled, that had begun but had stalled, that this work was going to be completed because this is indeed the work of God. It would be completed not because of strength and ingenuity and ability, Natural means, all those things are vital and important, and God brought those things to bear in the, in the construction of this great city. He says, but the work 
is secured and right and will happen because this is the work of the Spirit of God. That this is what God is up to. This is what God is going to complete. This is a lamp that burns with oil that can't be purchased, bartered for, traded, or made by hands. This, this burning light comes from the trees of God. Fresh oil, new oil, a gift of grace, a gift of mercy. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And then you have it move from there to this great declaration. It talks about the mountains. And we have this line, Who are you, O great mountain? Who are you, O great mountain? Do you remember when Jesus talked about faith? And he said, just the smallest grain of faith can say to the mountain, get out of my way. Jesus is echoing a line from Zechariah. O great mountain, standing as an obstacle before the workings of the Lord. What is the mountain in front of the working of the Lord? The O great mountain has to move at the word of God. So there is this promise that God's spirit will do it. There is this image of faith speech that the mountain must bow in the presence of the Lord. And then he says this, he will, Zerubbabel, bring forth the capstone and the people will shout grace, grace to it. Grace, grace to it. God bless it. God bless it. Remember last time we were together, uh, they were measuring out with the plumb line, making the measurements. They said, okay, that one that has made the measurements, who will lay the capstone? It'll finish. It'll be completed. And when it is, the people will recognize that this is the work of God. This is the work of his grace. This is the work of his kindness. Those are good things already. And then the fourth thing that came out of that explanation in 5 to 10 is this. Uh, for who has despised the day of small things? The prophets who came to speak to God's people during this season of life recognized that there was a, there was a, a prejudice against small things. Those who had seen the pri previous temple uh, thought the new temple was small comparison. And there was a celebration and there was a mourning all at the same time. And the young people who hadn't seen the old temple began to shout with joy. And the old people who had seen the old temple began to mourn and weep. And from the distance, you couldn't tell the shouts of joy from the mourning and the weeping. And God's prophets came in the midst of that and said, hey, quit that mourning and quit that weeping. Oh, we've gotten a little work done, but it's such a big project. I don't think we'll ever finish. Let's just stop and let's go work on our paneling at our houses. Oh, we've got a few small things done. We pull the measuring lines out. We gathered a few materials together. We raised a little money. We got a few small things done, but what are a few small things in light of the grandness of this project? And they despise the small things. And the angel of the Lord wakes them up to say to them collectively, don't despise the small things. What in fact is a grand thing? Isn't it just a whole bunch of small things done consistently over a season of time? That room we worship in, it's not the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, but it's quite a room and one of the cooler ones in our county. It wasn't built in a night. Scores of people, scores of hours, scores of days, weeks, a couple of years. Day by day doing small things over and over and over again. That resulted in a large thing. They had to drive the nails, run the conduit, pull the lines, put the wood down. Regrettably later, many years later, put carpet on top of that wood. But small things that added up to a grand thing. The message for Israel was don't despise the small things. 
He was teaching them to think little. You know, everybody says, you got to think big. You got to think big. Uh, Scott Adams would say, you got to think bigly. Everybody teaches us to think bigly. All the while, God would help us to see that bigly is small. Consistently, faithfully, over and over and over and over again, it adds up, it makes a difference. If you don't believe that from the positive side, how many of you are taking Lipitor? Yeah, because that stuff little by little makes a negative impact in your arteries. But on the positive side, those little things done as God calls us to by his spirit, they add up to the great accomplishment that God has called us all to participate in. We used to sing in the church that I pastored, little little country church I pastored while I was in seminary in New Orleans, little as much as God is in it. Do you remember that, that old song? That was Bud Newsom's favorite song. And when Mr. Bud would lead those singing on Sunday nights, he'd always want to sing, little as much if God is in it. It had this sort of kind of whiny Appalachian feel to it. Uh, and, and we'd just go all over the place with that song. Uh, I said, Mr. Bud, why do you like that song? And he just looked at me and said, well, son, because it's true. <laughs> I thought that's why we ought to be singing songs, right? Little is indeed much if God is in it. And this is the message to Zechariah. This is the message to Zerubbabel. This was the message to all of Israel. God is in the work he's called you to do. And those little things in his eyes are big things. And they put together to make something grand. And when it's completed, people will say, grace, grace to it. God bless it. God bless it. And then in 11 to 14, you have another image. And it's a further explanation of the image. The question follows, well, what about those two olive trees? What are they, those trees that feed the lampstands? He said, these two are the anointed ones who stand in my presence and the direct implication and interpretation in Zechariah 4 is that this represents Joshua, who we looked at last week, and Zerubbabel, who we look at this week. Those who were anointed in the Old Testament times were the kings and the priests. Joshua represents the religious life of the, the, the community, the people who come together and worship. Zerubbabel represents uh, the, the admin, if you will, the doings and the goings. And we make too big a distinction between ministry and administry, between the common and the holy, the sacred and profane. There was no fierce division uh, in Zechariah's day. And he was saying, look, this stuff we're doing Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, all this week long, these things we're doing in construction, that's holy work to God. This arranging, this organizing, this measuring, this sweating, uh, these, these sore muscles, all of this stuff, this is done because it is sacred and because God's life is in the midst of it. And, and so we have Zerubbabel to think about. And then we come and in, and in worship we come. This is all about the worship. And in worship we come and we bring ourselves before God and all of this work that Joshua is doing and is calling us to do, this is special before God too. If you, if you push it all the way out into our day through the lens of the New Testament, you have the calling to be priests to one another, just like Joshua was a priest for God's people. And as we are priests to each other, as we represent God to each other, as we represent each other before God, as, as mediaries and, and intercessory prayers, as we do the work of the priest, we recognize that the only work of the priest that we can do that matters is the work that comes from the fresh oil that's poured into our lives by a true and a living God. We're not just helpers, we're priests. And it's the anointing that makes the difference. And also, if you push it on out to this current day through the lens of the New Testament, you recognize that we have, a, related to the work of God, some administration to do. David Bevington, I preached a sermon series on the prophethood of all believers. And I talked about the priesthood of all believers in that. And he stopped me after church one Sunday morning and he says, Matt, when are you going to talk about the kingship of all believers? He said, this is one of the great, one of the great contributions of Baptist 
to the church writ large. He goes, this is present in Scripture as the church gathers to discern the direction of, of God in our midst and makes decisions and administers the way uh, of the church according to the will of God. He said, when are you going to talk about that? I said, I don't know. i got to find time. i got to figure that out. But it's true that there is a kingship of all believers. But the only way it works is when we work it from biblical patterns and notions and ideas. It doesn't work by us standing up and pounding a thing and saying, this is my church. It works when we humbly come together and we say, we are the body of Christ and he is the head. And how will we together discern the rhythms and the ways of Christ in our midst? And it works when we recognize that there's fresh oil that comes from a living tree that feeds the lampstands in the midst of God's people. It's quite a vision. There's a lot to consider. But here's the word of encouragement I want you to take with you. Little is much. If God is in it, we sing it because it's true. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by God's spirit, says the Lord. We should not despise small things. We should do those small things he calls us to do faithfully and with joy and with confidence. Because to him, those things are huge. And they add up to make a great difference in this earth. And confronted with the mountain, confronted with the mountain, we should have enough confidence, humble confidence, to say, mountain, what great mountain, mountain. Get out of our way in the name of the Lord. Those mountains come and they're real. But here's another one for you. But God is realer and that is good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being the Lord of the lampstands. We thank you for being the anointer of your people. We thank you, Lord, that you feed us with your life and energy and hope and encouragement and passion. Renew us, Lord. Wake us up from our slumber when we falter. Lord, grow us on the inside that we may do your work in this community. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Are we going to sing that song now, Will? We are. All right, good. We'll sing a different stanza each week till we finish. Rejoice the Lord is King. So today is the day for stanza two. 215, something back toward the back of your packet. Rejoice the Lord is King. There's that word again, so let's do that. Let's be rejoicing people today. As we stand and sing, stanza two.